you guys were so early in the game. I mean, you started podcasting in what, like 2003 or something? Uh, yeah, it had been about 2003, 2004. Yeah, somewhere around there. Okay, so 2003, 2004. We started The Art of Charm in 2006. We just kept going. You took a little break, yeah. decade long or so. Uh, but you had a few shows in there. Why did you start doing it back then? Because it seems like back th- people ask, oh, why'd you start in 2006? You, did you see the, did you predict the uh, rise of podcasting? The answer is no. Back then there was no information, but back in 2003 there was even less than nothing. I mean, that was, you were doing something, that, the odds of somebody watching it were low. Yeah, I mean, it was one of those things where Apple had announced support for it, which was huge. Like, just the fact that they would support podcasting mm-hmm. and allow you to syndicate that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I remember that, um, well, we were doing traditional television. So we were working on uh, at Tech TV, and this is, we're talking about, you know, an organization of 500 plus people to run a station. <laughs> yeah. And we realized that this model is is gonna go away, or at least uh, the idea that you could just turn on a camera and have two guys sitting on a couch uh, having a conversation was for, for zero to, you know, I mean, with the cost of the cameras and, yeah. and our time. Sure. And we did that and people started to watch. I mean, we started to get pick up and it ended up being, you know, a couple hundred thousand people were watching by the our kind of peak, which back then those numbers were pretty. That's impressive. still really good to what to do a stream video and have a couple hundred thousand people watch is huge. Yeah, and, and we had started bringing on uh, sponsors back then. Uh, Squarespace was a our, they were the we were the first show that they actually advertised with, which was crazy. So Squarespace has been OG podcast flooding the podcast market since two thousand and three. A long time, yeah. Anthony, uh, the CEO over there, um, he was a super nice guy and just believed in us and started backing us and then GoDaddy did and some some of these other brands um, and it Jeez. you know it, it paid the bills and it made it so that we could just do more of this back then the problem was that um, video syndicating video was extremely expensive like bandwidth was mm-hmm. really pricey so we were spending twenty thousand dollars plus a month oh, on man. on video bandwidth which is crazy wow that and that's not even like 1080p no, resolution this is, yeah. video so that was, we had uh, Cashfly we were using back then to like syndicate all of our bandwidth. And um, yeah, but we started a whole network around it called Revision 3. And so that was a whole podcast network. We had like six or seven different shows on there and it was so fun. I remember a long time ago, Dignation had done a sponsorship with Axe, or Axe had done a sponsorship for Dignation. That's right. And I created all the content for Axe's website that you guys were doing. It was all this like dating related content and all this like lifestyle related stuff. So that was my first introduction to you guys was I was like, so these guys are gonna get paid for just talking about the fact that I spent like a month making this? <laughs> I'm in the wrong business. Well, I appreciate you doing that. Yeah, yeah. You guys did like a 30 second bump and I'm like, that's it? I spent so much time on this. And they're like, yeah, th- this cost us like a ton of money for them to promote. And I just went like, okay, I gotta get on that side of this equation. Yeah, that, I remember are. they came to us, they're like, will you use Axe body spray? And I'm like, do I have to like use it at home? Like, or can, <laughs> can I just I like use it once? spray it on the show? Yeah. And so it was fun though. smell of vision cameras. And you guys did a lot of big live shows back then. Like you don't, it, podcasting nowadays, you don't see a lot of people doing live shows. It's starting to come back, but yeah. what was the biggest live show you did? Uh, we did one in London for future web apps that was probably 4,500 people or something like that. Not bad. Yeah, it was nice. a pretty decent little showing. Well, I want to go back to some of the, I want to bring some content to the, the listener because right now they're like, great, cool, got a primer on Kevin Rose. Thanks yeah. for thanks for wasting <laughs> yeah, my yeah, time, yeah. Jordan. Let's, let's talk. Uh, but I'm curious what got you started with the interest in technology because I know that you is it true that you dropped out of college? Is that accurate That's to say? That's right. Okay. So you dropped out of college, but you're not the type of person that just goes, eh, this isn't for me. I'm going to bounce. You're an Eagle Scout, right? So that takes 10 years of suffering through <laughs> a lot of things that most people don't want to do. I'm also an Eagle, Eagle Scout. And I remember doing like, some, some of it's great. Most of it's yeah. great. Some of it is terrible. Yeah. And some of it is just plain torture, especially the Eagle Project. So what was your eagle project? I spread wood chips and repainted a fence uh, at my elementary school. Nice. Oh, yeah. I, I repainted a school as well. Nice. There you go. It's so there's the, a school in our neighborhood that does like it was old and dilapidated, and we yeah. came in and just like stripped all the paint off and repainted it. Yeah, that's a, that's hu- a huge job. I mean, we're talking a hundred yeah. man hours for an eagle project. These are not simple little think one off things you got to do. You got to manage the whole thing. You got to buy all these supplies. So those are a big deal. So you're not the kind of person who's like. 
eh, college sucks. I'm just gonna stumble into something. You must have seen something that was more attractive than what you were doing in school. Yeah, I think that it was pretty straightforward. It was 1999-ish, and the whole internet.com boom was happening. So, you know, I was reading about all of these companies going public and all the crazy stuff going on in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And I, I was like, why am I wasting my time in school? Like, I need to be up there. I need to be working in this industry. And so uh, I just thought, well, I'll see what I can do and go on monster.com and apply for some jobs. And <laughs> if I land anything, right. at least I'll be up there. And so I, I landed a job and, and moved up here and ended up uh, working in tech and watching all that explode in my face. And my, my company that I was working at, um, Next Office, was selling uh, office furniture online. <laughs> okay. And they for other startups to buy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they went out of business, and that's how <laughs> I ended up at, te at Tech TV from there. Okay. But it was it was really just realizing that when you're sitting there and you're studying computer science and you you're just bored out of your mind because your instructors are teaching you really old antiquated cobalt. Yeah, cobalt, yeah, yeah. Like, stuff like that. It's like it was it was so clear to me that I could either just learn this on my own or go work in the industry and learn it along the way. So I, I chose to duck out and I figured I could always go back to school if I needed to. Yeah, you can. I, I wonder though, what would you tell somebody who's in school right now who's like, I'm gonna drop out because cryptocurrency, you know, or something like that. How do you know if what you're doing is going to take you in a useful direction or if you're just being sort of a trend hopper and you're sacrificing long-term success for sort of short-term gratification? Yeah, you know, this is a really tough question because it, it really varies from person to person and idea to idea. And yeah. I, I feel like um, I meet a lot of entrepreneurs because part of what I do during my, my day job is to invest in technologists mm -hmm. and people that are starting new companies. And one of the things that I think is really important is you have that kind of gut feeling of this is something that is going to be, if I had to close my eyes five, ten years from now, this is going to be an order of magnitude or larger project that I could get involved with today. Um, and you, it has to be driving you so hard that you're willing to give up that other thing or you're willing to set that aside for a while. And so it, you really shouldn't be looking for validation from someone else. That's, that's when I get worried. Mm -hmm. When someone comes to me and they say like, oh, I, I kind of think I should do this. Like, what do you think? Like looking for that external validation from sure. someone before they go and start something. Um, those are the founders that I really don't want to back because they don't have that, that kind of internal connection to their project and idea that says they must do this, you know? And, and I, I find that the best ideas often sound extremely crazy to almost everyone, myself included, the investors included, but not to the founder. And so if you think about like some of the, the, the big projects that we've seen, whether it be like um, you know, a cryptocurrency like a Bitcoin or uh, a Tesla or whatever it may be, if you go back to when they first started, everyone thought they were just nuts. Sure. I mean, these ideas were just like, they're never gonna work, right? But that's the kind of founder and the kind of person that I want to be able to back is someone that is so bought in and so sold on their own idea. And granted, like you can be drinking your own Kool-Aid and it could blow up. Sure. But at least you have that conviction to not only launch the project, but stick with it over time. Because you have to, like as a founder and someone that's starting something new, it's not going to be <clears throat> like just like zero to the cover of you know, Forbes magazine. Like that's not the way the path of an entrepreneur goes. Tell me about it. Like it's just, it's, it's just <laughs> still like, waiting on that cover, guys. Yeah, it's it's from launch to like a bunch of like loops and squiggly lines, like all the way up to success. Yeah. And so, um, if you are kind of somewhat bought in on your idea, but you're not totally sold on what you want to go build in your vision, um, when you start hitting those loops and those curves and those twists, you're going to be like, ah, oh, this oh, this isn't working. I'm out, right? Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to forge forward and, and push through those those big hurdles that you run into. And so um, I guess what, what I, I, I'm tr really trying to find when I'm looking for a founder is someone that has that, that kind of like that, that switch that has gone off in their brain saying that like, this is what I'm gonna go build no matter what. Um, so that's what I look for. Does the idea have to be big? I got a video in my email inbox yesterday from a guy who's like, I left school, I'm 18, and here's a video about why I did it. And I'm like, I don't. I really don't want to watch this, but I'm going to watch this because mm -hmm. 
maybe this person has a really great idea or maybe I can be like, this is a terrible idea, you should not do this. I watched the video, it was a lot of rambling about how he's gonna change the world and I was like kind of waiting for the idea, no idea at all. And I wrote back, this is a terrible move, you should go back to school, figure out what you wanna do. I realize you have a lot of energy, but you can, there are ways to channel this inside something that's gonna give you long-term success. I'm positive it fell on deaf ears. But when I get emails in my inbox from a lot of folks, they ask me, should I be in school right now or should I try to get a job working in the industry? I'm a fan of getting a job working in an industry. I'm also a fan of education if you don't know what else you might want to do mm -hmm. because it's really easy to go work at uh, Chipotle. No offense to somebody working at Chipotle, but it's really easy to go there and then just not do anything and wait for inspiration to strike you, right? There's nothing wrong with working at a place like that if you're working towards something else or if that's where you decided you're happy. And I think a lot of people who just don't want to be in school, they think, should I just do something else instead? And I don't know, what do you think about that? Looking back on somebody, 2020 hindsight, your leap from school was a good move. But you, at some level, have to realize that most people who leave school, or a certain percentage of people who leave school, they're not doing it for the right reasons. So the founders that you back are convicted about a specific idea, right. what if you're just convinced that school isn't for you? Where do you stand on something like that? What can someone do if they know school isn't for them, but they don't have a killer startup idea in a technology sphere? Well, I, I, it's hard when you don't know exactly what your idea is going to be. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that for me, I would, I would want to do a little exercise with that person where you list out like your ideal career and then your backup career. So mm -hmm. you have like kind of both out there because most likely you're not gonna stick with that first initial ideal sure. career. And then ask yourself like, what are the requirements for those jobs? Like does that actually require a formal education mm -hmm. and a degree? Because you know, I'm not gonna go practice medicine unless I finish school. I thank, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> appreciate so, that. So it's like, you know, you, ha you really have to figure, for me, I, when I was looking at that kind of equation, I, I figured, well, it's computer science, right? And if I'm gonna be working in tech and IT, and I thought, okay, well, number one is I wanna be a network administrator, and I know I wanna go and help people like configure their networks, and like that is largely certification driven. And so for me, I was like, okay, I can just go out and get these certifications and I'll be A-OK. -okay. I'll be able to make that seventy-five to $100,000 a year mm -hmm. over time. Like, that's, that's great. And so that, I checked that box. Now, if it, I was doing computer science, like, yes, I can teach myself that and then go and have a, 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 you know, actually a profession writing code. So those are two areas where I didn't need that formal education or I could go and be self-taught. Mm -hmm. That doesn't apply to everyone. So I'd really come down to what are their interests and do they need to have that schooling. And I'm a big fan of going out and trying things, especially when you're young. You can always go back to school and you know, failure teaches you so much. Like I've, I've probably, out of all the startups I've done, which has been you know, probably a half dozen or more, <laughs> like yeah. two of them have had successful out, uh, exits. The rest have all failed. And so you always learn something. There's always, there's so much to learn there the, from those failures. Th those failures, I, I, I think, are kind of a badge of honor. I don't look at them as, I used to get, you know, really depressed and think like, oh, failure is like, it's so embarrassing. Yeah, and like, sure. And, and I think that, um, you know, it's just, fa failure is really just admitting that you've learned something at the end of the day. That's all it is. As you've said, like, I've, I went and tried something, it didn't work out, and now I've learned something, and well, I'm gonna take that forward in the, into the next thing that I attempt. And oftentimes you don't obviously make the mis same mistake twice, so um, your companies, the way you manage people, all of that improves over time. Were you surprised by any of your failures and as well by your successes, or was it kind of like, okay, these, looking back, were clearly not going to work at all? Uh, but I guess I'm curious because when I look at anybody's idea and it, I find out it hasn't worked, usually I'm like, why would this have ever worked? But then you look at someone's successful ideas and you go, why would this work <laughs> right. at all? Right. So it's equally mystifying for me when I look at businesses just as ideas. Right. The ones that are winners are not necessarily clear. Look, if you zoom out far enough, of course we want an online bank. Of course PayPal was going to be a successful company. But then you think, we need online garage sales. No. Right. But eBay is a huge success, and that's basically what it is. Right, exactly. Right? So I, I, I guess what I wonder is when you look at your own track record, are you thinking, like, I cannot believe Dignation was huge? Or are you thinking, I can't believe Oink didn't work? Yeah, I mean, I think, 
I th all those things. I, the, there's so many emotions to unpack wrapped up in each one of those ideas. I, for me, I try to have in a kind of internal thesis around an idea and back to that kind of close your eyes and imagine it five years from now. And I want to be able to think to myself, like Oink is a great example for the, almost I'm, probably one person listening to your podcast knows what Oink was. <laughs> yeah. So Oink was essentially a way, if you've used Yelp or if you used Foursquare of any of these services, back here, gosh, like 10 plus years ago, I launched an app that allowed you to go inside of a location. So any restaurant, any place, like an amusement park, whatever it may be, and rate and rank the individual objects inside of that location. Oh, wow. So if you showed up at a restaurant, you would instantly know what the most popular, most like item was inside of that. If you went to a theme park, you would know the, the best ride inside of that. Um, so if you went to a, a dental office, you'd know the highest ranked individual dentist inside of that dental office. So, um, you know, in my mind, I was thinking like the issue and the problem to address was that we have kind of, um, there's like this uh, analysis paralysis when you walk into a place and you don't know what to choose or what to, what's the best thing here, especially when you're going into a, a new place for the first time. And so I, I wondered if people would help apply the wisdom of crowds and rank and rate those things inside of those establishments. And so, um, you know, it, it really didn't work. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it worked in that there was a, a very small, dedicated, hardcore group of people, myself included, that really enjoyed doing that. Mm -hmm. But that's in the order of several, you know, 10, 20,000 people. It wasn't hundreds of thousands or millions, millions of people. Yeah. So, um, you know, you try an idea like that, you see if it has traction, and then you have to be uh, ready to kill it off and, and say this isn't working, we've tried all of the features that we wanted to try that we thought were going to work and let's kill it off and move on to something else and that's, that's what we did. How good were you or was this a skill you had to learn at actually saying, okay, divorce my emotions from this, this isn't working and I can't sit here and blame other people for that because I feel like me not having had to wrap up a company my gut instinct, my emotional instinct, and I know I realize this isn't productive or mature or whatever, but I would be like, this can't be my fault. I've got to figure out who in the marketing department screwed this up or where someone else went wrong or no, we're going to keep doing it because I can't lose. I, there, I would do, I would go through all of those phases. Yeah, absolutely. I think that it's really easy to try and place blame on, on other folks and other individuals. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, as the creator, or a creator of a project or founder of a project, you're the ones, that, the one that's making these hires. So it's it all flows you're back right. up to the top. Yeah. Um, yeah I mean. So I would spend a ton of time, especially going forward with new companies, on really properly vetting people and finding the right people for those roles. I think that early on in my career, when we were trying to hire out and fill positions. It was, um, you know, we called it just like throwing warm bodies at a problem. Like you would just <laughs> yeah. like get in resumes and be like, okay, you, you seem to check the boxes here. I think I can micromanage you enough to, so that you will perform. And that's not really not the way you should go about it. And so, you know, one of the things I learned when I joined Google was just how much time and effort went into their hiring process and how careful they were about um, allowing new people in the door but when they did, when you passed all of those hurdles and we hired someone inside of Google, they gave you the keys to the castle. So they let you really run and break things and, and go and execute. So it was, there was a lot of trust once you had already gotten in the door, but a lot of kind of uh, skepticism leading up to that. So, um, you know, the, the, the Google hiring process was so... I mean, it was a little too heavy-handed, and it was uh, some of the questions and things that they would ask sure. were just r ridiculous. But um, it was because they really wanted to properly vet folks um, and, and really hire the right people. We would leave roles open for, you know, six, eight, twelve months at a time, and really fi rather find the right person for a role than hire the wrong person. Are you? Th do you think you're better at spotting? trends right now given your current position or do you think you're just better at spotting people who can accomplish things? I would say that it's for me it's a little bit of it, it re requires kind of 50-50 you know it's it, for me I have to fall in love with the idea obviously mm -hmm. that's first and foremost um, is I'll hear an entrepreneur will send over 
what they call it like a deck where it's their PDF with 12 different slides in there showing what they want to go and build. Mm -hmm. And you know, if I'm hooked on that idea or that concept, then I want to go meet the founders for coffee. And then the second hurdle is sitting down with them and getting really excited about the team that they've put together and believing that that's the team that can go and accomplish this big idea. Um, and then also really, I think the other thing that's really important to, to mention is there are a lot of really good ideas that I consider, and I'm excited for the founders to go and build, but they're not venture-backed ideas. They're not these massive billion-dollar companies. They're more lifestyle businesses, hmm. which I, I think is, is it's a really a shame that the, the way that we kind of look at these, because oftentimes, um, at least in, in the Bay Area and in the Valley, you think like, it's almost like if a founder comes to you with an idea that isn't a venture-backed idea but a smaller business, they're, they're, they're looked down upon for not thinking big mm -hmm. enough. And really that's such a Western way of thinking. It just really bothers mm -hmm. me. Um, that it's a very Silicon Valley way of thinking. Yeah, I because think. there's so many great little businesses. And I think that we, uh, as a society, I, I, I really wish that we would celebrate um, the thoughtfulness and, and thoroughness of like someone getting really excited about something and not really how big that can eventually become. Like I'll give you a great example. There, last time I was in, in Tokyo, I went to this little coffee shop and this, this um, gentleman probably in his late 70s, early 80s, wears a little tie and it probably seats like 10 people and you walk in and he ages these coffee beans. So he takes coffee beans and he ages them like wine. I didn't even know you could do that. Yeah, it's crazy. So okay. he, he has vintages from the, like this going back to the 70s. Um, Sounds for, like moldy coffee beans. No, so here's the, you can age them. The bacteria kind of like creates this like, you know, really healthy environment for them. As long as you don't roast them, you keep them green. Ah, okay. And they will age and then you fire them just before you're about to serve them and then you consume them. And it creates a really amazing, mellow, beautiful coffee. $80 coffee cup? No, no, actually it's, he just charges standard prices. And so- Even for 70s vintage coffee? Yeah, they're like, you know, I would say the equivalent of seven or eight dollars US for a cup of coffee like that. So it's a little bit on the higher it's side. It's like Jamaican Blue Mountain at Phil's. Yeah, Come exactly, on. exactly. So, but you go in there and you realize that this gentleman just has a love for that craft and for mm -hmm. what he's doing and is so proud. I mean, just wipe, you can see it in the way he wipes down the countertops mm -hmm. and like cleans every little crevice of every little thing that he touches. The pride in that lifestyle business um, is just so uh, endearing, you know, when you watch something like that. And we just don't have that here in the States. Like there's no, there's no appreciation. We call them hobbies. We call them hobbies. We don't, we, and we look down on people who try exactly. to make those their business. Exactly. So I, it, when I see that happening from certain founders or entrepreneurs, it's just like, it's a shame we don't celebrate those people as well. You well, know? I, well, hey, look, I agree. I, I think creative pursuits are worthwhile, and it's something I had to learn by doing it. It took me 10 years to realize this, this was a creative pursuit in the first place. But I'll, I'll tell you, you're definitely right about the, the venture capital snobbery, if you will. Uh, I was at a party a long time ago. I told you about this one, Jason. I was at a party a long time ago. Jason had just started working with me, and I said I was talking about. It. I just oh, he just hired someone to work with me on my show and my podcast. Da, da, da. And the guy goes, oh, uh, well, how do you support yourself? And started talking about the business model of Art of Charm and things like that. And he said, yeah, you know, my company's venture backed. We just did it. And he was really trying to sort of like one up, but like stomp me down. Hard. Right, right. And I remember a lot of people were really off put by that. And I felt so like belittled. And I remember just thinking, screw manners. And I said, so you took out a huge loan. That's what you're bragging about right now. And everyone was laughing and I was so mad. But I was like, Oh, I just want to zing this guy, right? Because right. it was, so what? You took out a big loan. So someone else owns your business now. Like, I, right. I remember just thinking, what are you bragging about? Other people think your idea is good. Other people like this too. They download it, right? So I, they're putting their time into it. So there is a snobbery there. But at the end of the day, what you're saying is other people believe in your idea. So they gave you a big loan. So right. it's, it's really not, and I know I'm talking to the wrong person about this, or maybe the right one, because this is your job. But I think there is an overemphasis placed on the amount of money you can borrow. And you see that even in the crypto world now with raising mil tens of millions of dollars for a project that can be run by five guys in a basement. Yeah. Or five coders. Not all necessarily guys. Right. <laughs> in a basement. Right. Right? Yeah, I mean, it, there's, there's, 
there's certainly a, a balance that you have to, to strike there. Like some of these companies raising the, so much money for no apparent reason, mm -hmm. even I scratch my head at those things and stay away from them. When, um, but there's other businesses that truly yeah. do need the money well, of course. To, to, to really go and scale. A lot of these big ideas are very capital intensive. Like you talk about you know, creating a production facility at Tesla or you know, scaling out what, what Peloton is doing or what Fitbit did. These are some of the companies that I, we've kind of worked with in the past. And it's like you need to have a lot of infrastructure in place to make those a reality. Um, and so venture funding in those cases does uh, actually does make sense. It makes it possible instead of impossible. Right, right? Exactly. I, to I totally understand that. When you say that you look at founders to see if the founder is the person who's got the conviction for the idea and you look at the team to see if they can accomplish it, what are you looking for? Because a lot of founders think, oh, I just need a really good idea, which we, you sort of covered is not true. You just need an idea, but you also need the team. But how do you know if this is a team that can do it? It can't just be about enthusiasm because everybody that walks into your office is probably enthusiastic. Everybody on Shark Tank looks pretty convinced, yeah. but they're not necessarily capable. What are you evaluating? Well, I think that um, first and foremost is to make sure that the idea isn't a slight iteration of something that already exists today. There's a lot of founders that come out there and say, I have a better version of X, Y, or Z. I'm Uber for this. Right. I'm Pinterest yeah, sure. for that. I'm you know, Twitter for this. And, they, and it's like, you know, Twitter for cats or whatever, why it may be like, uh, <laughs> it may, it may be like that a sounds massive awesome. business. Yeah. But yeah. it's, it's kind of, you look for original thinking. So, uh, that's, so something that's truly a novel idea is kind of what I'm trying to find. And then um, when you sit down and talk about their vision, is it, how kind of fully fleshed out is that? Is it something where it's it's just like this is an idea that that came up in the shower, or have they really spent a lot of time looking at the landscape as it exists today, who their potential competition is, um, and then who they're surrounding themselves with? Like who is the, on their founding team? Um, what is their background? If it's a technology-based product, like and they're doing hardware, do they have a hardware background? So many founders that get into hardware think that um, oh, I'm, I'm just going to create the next you know, Apple Watch or whatever it may be, and they don't really, they might have an uh, engineering background from school, but they've never actually spent any time in China. So just mm. making sure that they're really thinking about all of the different aspects of their business um, and, and really evaluating that initial team. So oftentimes I'll meet, uh, I would say it's a team of two or three by the time that I meet them, like a, a group has come together. And so I like to sit down with each of those folks and, and really assess out who they are and what they're trying to build. Now, when it comes down to the hardware side of things, what do you think about Kickstarter and all of these guys? Like, is, it, is, is that like a really viable place where people can test out these ideas before they go to look for funding? Or uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I've certainly seen a lot of Kickstarter projects go off and then become venture-backed businesses long-term as they need to go out and scale. Um, again, it's, it's like if they are actually, if it's something where they're manufacturing, like I back this uh, amazing, like it's called like a heavy blanket on Kickstarter. I saw like, you that. Got one oh, of it's amazing. It, like, it, it looks so comfortable. It like calms you down. It, it weighs like 75 pounds or whatever. <laughs> it's like having a hug on you all the time. And so you just wrap it around you and you just like, you get all like snuggly in it. And what is it called? The gravity blanket? Yeah, gravity or blanket. What yeah. a great name too. Yeah, it's really. It just tells you exactly. I saw that ad and I thought, Okay, that looks great, a heavy blanket. Right. <laughs> I don't know why we're all attracted to that. I don't know. So something about like being swaddled as a little yeah. baby or something that it, it it's sounds amazing. Be. It's got to be. It sounds awesome. It sounds sweaty to me. Yeah. It sounds it really is. sweaty. But on a cold day, it's raining outside, you got your little cup of tea, it could be amazing. Yeah. yeah. I don't I just, know. So, so for that people, was, people who just really always need a hug. Yeah. Right, what exactly. It is. Yeah. So that was one of those things where obviously you don't need to do like really deep due diligence on their technical team to create a, <laughs> yeah. to create a blanket. So, but you know, if it is something where I worry about some of these really um, uh, tech heavy projects and the founders that are putting them together, because there's a big difference between um, going to engineering school, creating a prototype, and then actually taking that and having it manufactured. I remember I was talking to um, uh, some of the, so I got to know the Nest founders really well and talking about how important it is to actually have, they call it like boots on the ground in China. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because you have to, like when you're going to have something manufactured, have hundreds of thousands, of thousands or millions of, of pieces uh, produced, like you have to be there through the entire process and the QA process and everything all the way down to getting it packaged and shipped. 
And if you don't, like the quality and making sure that every little, um, you know, things can break, things can fall through the cracks and y you just, you don't want to ship something that's going to catch on fire. Sure. <laughs> so, so it's, I, I worry about a lot of those, um, not in terms of producing hundreds of units because that's pretty easy to do, but when they start really scaling up, making sure they have the right team in place. Yeah, because supply chains are hard, uh -huh. it turns out. Absolutely. That's why 99% of Kickstarters don't ship. Yeah. That's right. So it seems like if you're doing hardware, going straight to VC seems like, I, I would never take anybody that hasn't actually tried to do it at, at some point on Kickstarter because right. it's like, A, you, you can test your ideas to see if they work, and B, you can get that supply chain experience if right. you haven't had it because nobody ships on time. Right. And the first iteration is always not what you think it's going to be. Like, I've got a Giro uh, suitcase that was Kickstarter. Yes, by, uh, that's the one with the charger built in and stuff. It's got a charger, but it's got the big giant wheels on it, yeah. which is the big thing. And it's, it was started by a lawyer, Ken Hertz, and a couple guys. And one of the big selling points was, oh, we've got this thing engineered down to the nth degree and it's self-balancing. And of course, when it shows up, they're like, yeah, we kind of had to make some design changes. And if there's nothing in it, it falls right over. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, you have to you have Oops. to kind of take take those kind of things into a, into consideration. So it seems like if I was going to be investing in anybody or if I was somebody who had an idea, go to Kickstarter first and get those bugs worked out, learn your supply chain chops and then go out in the real world and try and get VC and on your next run. Yeah, I like these projects that are doing like, you know, a few hundred units they're promising out, not in the tens of thousands. Like, mm, yeah. it's hard when you have a really cool idea, right? Because if you can sell 50,000 units, why not go and do it? But at the end of the day, it's like, you, to, to ship, uh, there's a big difference between shipping a couple hundred units and you know tens of thousands. So. Yeah, you see that a lot when people get overfunded. Right. They, they just implode. They're like, we can't make a million of these things. We haven't figured out how to make 20 of right, them. Right, exactly. What problems cannot be solved with money in companies like that? Because I'm, I'm picturing people right now going, I'm just going to hire supply chain people with the money that you give me, Kevin. What are you talking about? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I, I think that there are hardware incubators that are out there now mm -hmm. that work very closely with a lot of these manufacturers in China. And so I would have liked to see if they don't have experience at least paired up with one of those companies so that they are getting the right kind of um, advice and just really making the right connections there. Um, so I think it, it's got, it has gotten easier. If you look at where we were five years ago and a lot of these hardware incubators didn't exist, a founder really had to make those connections on their own. And so they'd have to like either fly out to China and meet with various manufacturers and just kind of like hopefully place their trust in one of these. And the problem is that the big like three to five manufacturers out there that do Apple products and all these other products, they, they they require a minimum number of units to even talk to you, mm -hmm. and those are in the hundreds of thousands. And so it's difficult because, um, <laughs> whoops, yeah, that's as, so as many. As a new founder, like you're not gonna yeah, really work with no them. No way. Yeah. Wow. That's uh, that's intimidating as well. Absolutely. So you're looking at a team, and I, I guess what I'm sort of curious about is what sort of team dynamics and what sort of people, aside from just their pedigree, their chops, whatever, what sort of team dynamics are you looking for? Because right now there's a lot of companies out there that have great teams or, or that think they have a team that's ready for prime time. What are you looking for at Google Ventures and your VC funds with these particular people? What's the people element that you really think these are people that are gonna do something magical? Yeah, I, I think it's, a, it's making sure that um, the team it doesn't have any major holes right away. So, um, you know, oftentimes I'll meet these founders that are really the product managers. So they have the idea, they know what they want to build, mm -hmm. but they don't necessarily have the design chops or the technical co-founder to actually make that happen. So making sure that at least the team that you're going to fund and going to back is in place or is very close to being in place before you actually back them. Um, so, you know, I'll meet an entrepreneur that says, I have this great idea, this is the plan, and these are the three people that are gonna join me once I receive my funding. Ah. And so, you know, you go and, and meet with those folks as well and say, okay, well, you know, if we're gonna put in a couple million dollars here. Yes, the, the plan is I'm gonna leave my job and go join. And, you know, so it's just kind of like making sure that they're, they're they don't have any blind spots and then they've really thought through who they're gonna need for this initial version because you typically try to fund someone to a, a first 
v1.0 of their product mm -hmm. so they can actually launch something um, or go have enough of a prototype ready so that they can go out and raise another round of funding and so I, I'm kind of just making sure that they they've thought that through um, properly it sounds like a lot of responsibility I don't know if I'd, I I don't know if I'd want that kind of responsibility for all that money to go and start your own company? No, I mean, of course. Right I, I'm doing it right now. I just mean for <laughs> other people. I don't know if I, like, I consider myself a decent judge of character, yeah. but I don't know. If I, I don't know about that. You hired me. That's true. See? <laughs> it's already falling already apart. Screwed up, right, in front of, right in front of you. It's falling apart right in front of you. To write a couple, because you're going to write checks that are for companies that are not going to do well. Oh, of course. The and majority some, of them will fail. Right. And you just kind of have to accept that a lot of the money you give away is you could light it on fire, right. and it would be equally well spent. That's right, yeah. and, and I think that's, that's fine. I mean, that's the process that you go through, is you back these founders, and you want them to be empowered to take massive risk. And so, you know, you're not backing them to be conservative and, and go off and build just like a, a hobby. It's, mm -hmm. it's really like, especially in the venture capital game, it's how can I build something that's going to change the world and affect, you know, tens of millions of people. And so if that's the case, um, you kind of want them to go out swinging for the fences. And, and, and so when they do that, they're going to, I hate using baseball analogies. Yeah. So they're gonna like, they're We're gonna, all athletes here. It's fine. <laughs> no, but, but really, they're, they're just going to, a lot of them, yeah. most of them are gonna, going to fail. But every once in a while, you're going to have one that turns in to the next Google or whatever it may mm -hmm. be, and those repay and, and make up the, the difference. Of course, yeah, the standard sort of VC model. So what are you most excited about now, being neck deep in tech trends all day yeah. and looking at things from the inside? Everybody's crazy about cryptocurrency and things like that. Yeah. What are you seeing that, that you're excited about besides the new Roadster? <laughs> the, the, the new Roadster <laughs> does look awesome. Um, honestly, what I'm excited about and what I put a lot of focus into has been less on the idea side. I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I am really excited about cryptocurrency mm -hmm. and we could go deep on that. Yeah, that's not a, sure that your audience probably would really another show, yeah. Another show. But um, I, honestly, it's my big focus over the last kind of year plus especially in working with founders, has been trying to help founders find a decent work-life balance and spend uh, less time in the office and less time working on their companies, but when they do spend time focused working on their, their, their businesses, to have that be more productive time. And so really encouraging founders to get off their phones, to have a real relationship with their significant others, um, or and, and really um, disconnect from technology, and so that's kind of been my focus in creating, um, you know, a meditation app. And 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 I realized personally that having gone through all these businesses, like I just burnt myself out, and I really got into a bad place and, and wasn't productive in doing so. And so, how can I help these, oftentimes very young entrepreneurs, like not go down that same path of? late nights, Red Bulls, pizza, and that, like, win at all costs, um, and, and really just uh, in, encourage them to be thoughtful about how they treat their employees and how they treat themselves in their, in their own bodies. How did you know you were getting burned out? Well, I think that um, there's the standard, I'm not sleeping as much, I have anxiety about my business, like, um, just that stuff creeps up on you. I think that when you're in your 20s and early 30s, it's really easy to power through a lot of that stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, and I just realized that I was, my brain was starting to really get a lot more fragmented. I would realize, I would find myself like having a tab open on an email that I didn't hit send on even though I should have sent it like six hours ago. Oh no. Or like, you know, you'd have like a hundred tabs open and I was realized, like, realizing that distraction was really um, causing me to spread my, myself so thin in a bunch of different directions. And to get back into that mode or that mindset of doing that one task would take, there's like a, a penalty you pay. Switching costs, Switching I think costs, is what they exactly. call it. Exactly. Yeah. And so the second you, allow yourself to be bombarded with all these different notifications, um, you know, you'll find that you're, you're bouncing back and forth between all these different things and you're not really that productive. So yeah. how can we limit that? How can we really force people to use less tabs to really kind of silo the things that they're working on so they can be more productive 
um, and then applying that to uh, their businesses so that they're rewarding um, quality of, of, of life outside of work and not just the, the work that they're doing. Is there a way for you to, for us to spot burnout? Is it just, because a lot of people go, well, I'm forgetful, I'm always like that. I mean, how, looking back at your own burnout, what would you, what was the indicator that this was a long time coming? Well, I, I think that um, for me, it was, it, it's really slow. It kind of builds over time. Mm -hmm. So there was no like one morning where I woke up and I was like, wow, I'm just, I'm just feeling burnt out. It was, right. it was kind of a little bit more anxiety and anxiousness around getting things done. And I remember that when you're in a startup mode, you're, you, you think that you're never going fast enough. And so there's this constant waking up and like, God, I need to get this done and we need yeah. to ship this product and this needs to be out on Friday. And there's never any satisfaction that can take place at that point because you're always on to the next thing and looking towards that next release or the next bug fix or whatever you need to get yeah. out there. Um, and so it was kind of like just reframing um, my expectations for and, and realizing that this is more of a marathon and not and not so much that that kind of like daily sprint and and really taking the time to force myself to create these hard breaks in my day and so once i could do that i realized i was feeling a lot more at ease and a lot more comfortable so if i could force myself to do let's say a breathing exercise halfway through my day or force myself to only check email during these two periods during the day, in the morning and then in the afternoon, and have that on my calendar, and never go into email at any other time. Um, force myself to install an extension on my, on my browser that only allows me to open four tabs. Um, You're one of those guys, huh? Just t tons of tabs all the time? I mean, I was just, I, it was, you get down, especially in, in being in tech news, and it, all of a sudden I find myself, you know, 10 tabs deep on tech news, five tabs deep on CNN and oh, other man. stuff that's going on with the world right now. And it, it's just like nothing's, nothing's happening but, but checking those things. Um, so just being a lot more thoughtful about how I splice those in to break up my day. And then all of a sudden you realize that um, in taking those breaks, the anxiety comes down and you can just have a little bit more time to be thoughtful about how you're thinking through your problems so you're not so rushed. And um, life just gets a little bit easier at that point. The app is called Oak, it's available now, and it's on, is it for your phone only, or is this something that you've got on your, you have the, I noticed you're wearing two wearables, so you clearly are into, yeah. why do you have two wearables on? Oh man, we could go deep on this. Yeah, so, what's go, what's going on here, Mister Disconnected? Yeah, <laughs> well, each wrist is occupied. Right that's now. right. So uh, the Apple Watch um, with the LTE, the new Apple Watch, is on my left wrist, and that is primarily for. Um, well, I use it for a bunch of different stuff, like in terms of turning on my lights in my house on and off, or unlocking my computer, or Apple Pay, things like that. Um, but the neat little hack that I have here is because it is connected to the internet. Um, well, first of all, the number one thing you can do with the Apple Watch is turn off all notifications because those are just distractions. Those are the worst type of distractions because they buzz your wrist and you look down and you get, have a new text that comes in or sure. whatever it may be. And so I turn everything off there and number one, your battery life just goes through the roof. So they quote these things that like having like one day battery life. If you turn all that stuff off, it's like two and a half days. Yeah, sure. It's magical. So um, the nice thing about this is I can leave my phone at home now. So one of the main things that I'm sure probably everybody notices out there is you find yourself like heads down in your phone all the time. I almost, I mean, I bump into people almost every day on the street because they're looking at their devices all the time. And so this allows me to say enough with the phone. I'm gonna take a, a fast, do a phone fast for a few hours. And if I go out to dinner with my wife or I go to meet an entrepreneur for coffee, I leave my phone back at home. And in emergency, should my wife have a problem, she needs to get hold of me, she can call. And that will go through to my actual watch because there's LTE there. But because there is no full function, full featured apps on the watch, I'm not using it like a phone. I'm not using it to go and browse Instagram. Right. I'm not using it. No tabs. No tabs. Zero, tabs, zero tabs, zero browser, right? So. That's what's so awesome about having this thing is as funny as it may sound, it's like even though this is a technology device, it enables me to use less technology in my life. It's funny you should mention that because I had gone on this tirade about how I'm never gonna get things like an iPad, which you just saw me use for the whole show, uh, and an Apple Watch. And he sent me the watch 
and I went, I'm, I don't even want to try it because I don't right. want more devices. But yeah. And he goes, I'm sending it to you anyway. Just check it out. You might like it. You're exactly right. Ironically, having this watch allows me to do far less BS because I don't have to have my phone with me all the time. So when I go on a walk where I usually read audiobooks, mm -hmm. I can read the book and I can write things down in a little notebook instead of writing them down in my phone because what happens is I write them down in my phone and I go, oh, I have three texts. Oh, oh, I'm, oh, Slack is going crazy. And then I go, crap, I just missed the last 20 minutes of this audiobook that I'm using That's to right. prep for the show because I was on Slack chatting and I, my whole system goes downhill. Now I've just got this thing. I can dictate a text. I can get directions. I can do the basic things that I usually want to do when I'm out. Exactly. And I don't have to have my phone with me. So Nailed that it. it really is a funny counterintuitive thing that having a device like the Apple Watch lets you use the phone less. And I know a lot of people are just like, you guys are so device dependent. You have to have all those things. But there is, there is a reality that you've got a young baby at home. You can't just be like, I'm gonna go away for the weekend with no point of contact. That's right. It's just unrealistic at this point. And if you own a business, you probably also can't do that. Right. So I know there's somebody out there chuckling to themselves about how we're tethered to these electronic devices, but it's, it's our reality in this particular space and, and at this point in your life especially. Yeah, yeah, so the, the other device, just to, it, so to finish up on the two devices yeah. on your wrist, I have a Fitbit on the right uh, wrist, and it's not a watch. It's the very thin one, so I don't look like I'm wearing two watches. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, I actually use this because it it's is- It actually just looks like you're wearing a women's watch and an Apple watch. That's right, that's right. That's <laughs> so what I was going for. You're wearing your wife's watch, that's too. That's right. So uh, this one actually is the only device that will work and do heart rate in a high temperature sauna. So I do these extreme high temperature saunas okay. a few times a week, and this is to ensure that my heart rate doesn't go over. I do a lot of the body hacking stuff okay. as well. Clearly. So this is to make sure that my heart rate doesn't go over 125 or so, and then I know to get out of the sauna when it's that high. Now, why are you wearing it when you're not in a sauna? I just like to have all the analytics. I'm super geeky when it comes to all the body yeah. hacking stuff. Like I also, I don't have it in today, but I typically wear a continuous glucose monitor. Oh, you do? That's, that's uh, injected <laughs> like into What? Hang on, you wear something that is shunted into you oh, all, yeah, I, all the day? Oh yeah, I, I basically, I have to stick this little syringe thing that, um, that injects a, a monitor into my belly fat and then it will show my glucose levels in real time on my Apple Watch on the, the main display. What? Yeah, so I can test out how different types of uh, refined carbohydrates impact my glucose level, and then yeah. also how quickly I dispose of glucose, which is important. Yeah, it's like insulin resistance exactly. type of stuff. Yeah, I don't have diabetes or anything like that, but yeah. it is certainly like they've they've shown that uh, in terms of like longevity and cancers and things like that, you shouldn't have a, elevated glucose for long periods of time. And so um, one of the things that I had issues with a while ago was disposal of, of glucose out of my blood. Um, there's something called the glucose tolerance test. I'm Massive into all the body. Yeah, yeah, stuff. that's is interesting. That though. We, we yeah, I mean, that's podcast. commitment to actually have something that is in your body all the time. So, is there a monitor in you right now? Not right now. Okay. No, but there will be in the next like twenty-four hours. And it just stays in your belly fat for about a week until you have to change it. A week to two weeks. And so, it just the battery it. dies or something? No, or? it's it's all in how much. Um, so it, there's this little adhesive thing that goes around the outside of the device. Okay. And as you take more showers, it starts to peel off, and then you have to swap it out. But it's inside; it's under your skin. Yeah, so it injects a little tiny thin wire into your that you can't feel into oh, the actual fat there, okay. and then um, that senses changes um, in your blood sugar, and then reports it back to the device, which transmits it back to the Apple phone or the uh, iPhone, and then to the Apple Watch. Where do you get this? So that one, you have to get a prescription from your I doctor. was going to say, this sounds like an actual medical device, yeah, not that something is a you can device. order off it's Amazon. It's called a Dexcom uh, glucose monitor. We'll link to that. Can we link to that? Or is that something that you cannot buy online? Oh, I mean, you could yet? talk to your doctor if you're curious about this stuff. There's a whole, um, I actually, Wired is calling me today to talk about it because there's a whole movement right now of people that do continuous glucose monitoring uh, all the time. Wow. That is bananas, but it changes the way that you eat. Probably can't Absolutely. actually eat bananas anymore. Speaking well, of the, well, it's interesting is everyone is a little bit different. So depending on how you digest certain things, like a banana will impact my blood glucose a lot differently than it will yours. So huh. it's just like keeping your eye on what's going on and knowing what you can and can't eat. If you could keep that thing injected into you 24-7 for the rest of your life, would you do it? Well, I mean, there's, there's rumors that Apple is working on uh, getting this data via LED. So that's the hope is that we'll eventually be able to get at your glucose levels with a non-invasive uh, 
version of this. So we'll we'll see if they can develop it. But yeah, I would I would absolutely do it. I think it's uh, it's fascinating to see how certain things. I mean, there's a whole like if you go to bed with elevated glucose levels, you kind of lock in your glucose overnight, which is not good. No, that's it's interesting. The inflammation, a bunch of other things, and so it's just like monitoring all that stuff and knowing when you're doing bad habits. I think is important. You obviously have kind of an extreme personality. Eagle Scout, drop out of school, start a bunch of companies injecting a wire into your belly to monitor glucose constantly. That obviously plays some role in your success as a founder, just d diving in and then going to like the nth degree Absolutely. in a certain area. Do you think that's a requirement for a founder to have, or do you think that it's just a requirement or just a thing that some founders have? I think it's, it's, it is a requirement for people. If you think of anyone that is really passionate about what they do. They tend to go all in mm -hmm. and, and, and really care about every little minute detail. Um, it's also important to be able to let that go and entrust other people to care about that for you just because yeah. you can't personally scale forever. Tell me about but, it. But you know, when I'm launching a new app, like I instrument every little facet of that app so I can understand what people are doing with it, where they're peeling off, why they're coming back, when they're coming back, because that's, that, that's how you can really help prune and tune the things that you create to, to make them more useful for a wider audience. And I, and I think that when I meet a founder, whether it's extreme aging of coffee beans or you know, someone creating the next social app, it's like you wanna look for that, that depth there and that curiosity about their one particular thing that they're into. Do you think everybody has that? And oh, they absolutely. Just, yeah. I, think, I think everyone can find that. And that's the beautiful thing about like living and creating new projects is they don't have to be massive businesses. Like I, 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 I really love that about all aspects of life. Like for me, I'm getting into like beekeeping now. That's like oh, my wife is a beekeeper. Are you, you serious? Yeah, we have bees. Are you? Well, we yeah. need to have a bee chat. Yeah, there's a picture of us. We were trans, I think I've told this on the show, I'm not sure. We went to go get a hive mm -hmm. from her friend and we duct taped it shut. Okay, this is a, bee, a hive full of bees right. that are now being moved, okay? We put them in the back of our car and I'm like, I'm keeping the bee suit on because even though it's in the trunk of the car, if anything happens, we're gonna have a car full of bees. Right. Angry <laughs> right. bees, right. okay? So, but then I thought, man, I'm in a beekeeper suit. We're both in a beekeeper suit. They look like hazmat suits. <laughs> You're driving around with this We're on. driving around. If we see a cop, we're going to get pulled over. Right. And we're going to have to be like, officer, don't open the trunk. Right. Right? It's not going to work. So she says, look, we've seen a cop like three times in our whole time living here. We're not going to see any police. We saw like seven cops on the way home. You didn't get pulled over. No, though. we didn't. No, but I'm thinking like, oh, look at the look at the ground. Look at your phone. And I realized it doesn't matter. I'm wearing a hat that goes all the way around right, my head right, right, right. and a big white suit, you know, with like elbow and knee pad kind of things built into it. And we're driving this car. And we put the we put this beehive in uh, my brother-in-law's backyard, and then she set up a nest cam. Speaking of nest, to to view the entrance 24/7. Yeah, it's my wife is obsessed with bees. So I have a buddy that believes that the bee stings are actually good for you. Have sure. you heard about these people? Uh, absolutely. People and with like arthritis go and get bee stings. So he just goes no suit, and he'll just let them like sting him, and he just like wow. considers it part of the process, and so walks up to the hive seven or eight different bites, peels them off, throws wow. them down, thanks them for their contribution to the universe. Yeah, because like, they like, die after he's that. Super, yeah, he's super hippie like that. Dang. But it's, uh, it's hardcore. Not, not even I'm a helmet? Not there. No, nothing, just like just walks up. Dang. Yeah. Well, that's a lot of bee stings to have. That's a great photo. Jason just showed me the photo Oh yeah, guys. that's us throwing a beehive in the trunk of the car. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, we're huge nerds if you haven't figured it. Well, we're in good company right now. Absolutely. Yeah, so you're, you're saying you were getting into beekeeping because you're finding new passions and uncovering Yeah, you just find things. a passion and you go really deep on it. You know, I, I just love doing that. I, I think that's kind of like when you meet fellow geeks and entrepreneurs that are, are really into their businesses, they, they tend to be these people that obsess over the details and obsess over things and, and just really get geek out on it. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm sure that's the case with you with, with everything that you do. And I, yeah. I, I think that uh, that's the trait that I look for. And you, you think that if I haven't, if I'm thinking I want to start a business or I don't want to do the job I'm doing right now, I have to find a passion where I'm so obsessed with it that it goes r really deep and all encompassing or maybe it's Ex not the right idea. Exactly. Oh, exactly. wow. That's interesting. Because I think a lot of folks think, uh-oh, I don't have passion about anything, so I'm in trouble. 
And other people might say, well, you know, you just have to be interested in it enough to run a business and then you can do other things with your life. But you really, it sounds like you really believe that you're going to find some idea that you're so into. Well, I mean, that's if you have that spirit of wanting to be an entrepreneur. Uh -huh, I, I okay. think that there's, there's a lot of people, I mean, really, I, I find that, that for me, like happiness is is really, you know, are you growing in who you are and what you're doing? And also, does your reality meet like your plan in your, he your head for who you are and what you want to be? And so I have a great example. A buddy of mine does customer service. Um, and I'm not going to go into the company, but it's a big tech startup out here. And, you know, doesn't make a ton of money, mm -hmm. but makes enough to get by. And he basically um, goes home, plays his Xbox, has a wonderful wife, and that matches his expectations for what he wants out of life, and he absolutely loves his job. He never wants to be a founder or an entrepreneur, but that's what he enjoys helping people. Hmm. And, and I think that, like, I've met so many people that are like that, I, and that's great. You don't necessarily have to be a founder or an entrepreneur or start something new. You can work for someone else and find something that you're passionate about, and that can be like your contribution. You I know? think that's useful advice because I think right now there's a lot of pressure for people to, every, well, everyone wants to be the lead singer. Nobody right. wants to be the backup, you know, right. s backup guitarist guy who's like in the shadows. Keyboard Ever, player. Or the something. keyboard player. Exactly. Podcast could, producer. Yeah, nobody wants <laughs> to be the podcast <laughs> producer. But you have to find people that love doing that, you know, right. and for for anything. And they're, they're equally important. And I think there's a lot of pressure for people right now, especially young people. Uh, young males maybe especially all want to start some sort of insert buzzword tech buzzword cryptocurrency right. app you know they all want to do that instead of working anywhere else and i think for me looking back right now if i had to do it all over again i would want to be someone's assistant for a long time some high performer's assistant because mm -hmm. That's the best way to learn stuff, learn high-performing habits and things like that. And I think the best way to learn tech is to be right up against it. Uh, but I think or learn that you don't want to do or it. Or learn that you don't want to do it, exactly. Yeah. And I think that it's dangerous for a lot of people to really want to jump in and start something just because they want the spoils, the fruits of that, mm -hmm. instead of finding something that they can really geek out on that they actually enjoy. Yeah, that, that honestly, I think you nailed it there, that there's, so, there's a lot of folks that I've run into, and this it's a big red flag when I see it. And that's when they are obsessed with the amount of money they're going to make yeah. over something. Yeah. So they're like, I'm doing this because it's going to, it's going to make me a lot of money. Right. Lambos. And, right. Yeah. Lambos. Yeah. Does anyone want a Lambo? No. I don't think anyone wants a Lambo. Nobody wants a Lambo. Wants but it's Lambo. the cliche, it's the cliche, uh, like goal of, of, of trading Bitcoin or something. <laughs> yeah, this is my Lambo shot. That's right. Please don't buy a Lambo. Yeah, nobody buy a Lambo. But um, I, I think that that's just like, the reality is, even if you're just a little bit successful and you're not gonna be happy, like that's not gonna really like do it for you. So if you, if you turn out creating a business or a startup that makes a few hundred thousand dollars a year, you're gonna wanna bounce and leave it and bail on everything and that's, you're not going to find any happiness there. So the, like, the focus really should be about the love and passion for the idea first. And if the money comes, that's great. But it, it really should be about, are you happy and satisfied if this idea works, but you don't make a lot of money? Well, I spent 22 years in tech thinking it was all about the money, and I was waiting for that big payday, waiting for yeah. that big payday. And then I was working for Jordan as no the... No payday. Well, no pay <laughs> I, I was the tech guy. I was you know running all the tech, running the servers and all that. But at night, we would get on the phone and geek the hell out about podcasts right. and talk about microphones and all this stuff. It turns out, yeah, I make a lot less money in podcasting, but I am a thousand times happier. Yeah. And it's it's way more fun. So, you know, yeah, I traded the, you know, the big payday for what I'm, you know, really passionate about now. And it took 20 years. So, you know, I, I would prefer that people do it a lot faster. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, don't don't keep grabbing for that golden ring if you're miserable because I was miserable in tech. Yeah. And in podcasting, I'm happy as a pig and you know you what. Is, yeah. It's funny is I, I didn't, I've never told you this, but I can, having known you for a really long time, I can certainly see it. I can see the change. I can see the difference. Because, really? Oh, 100%, dude. When I see you send me photos of the different podcasts that you edit and you have those up on your wall mm -hmm. and like you're proud of those because it's your work. You know, you're, you're, the great work that you're doing and it's just so cool to see you happy and passionate about something that you love which oh, is cool. awesome 
Speaking of passion projects, tell us about Oak. I We got cut off because I wanted to make fun of your wearable habit, but Oak is for, get, tell us what it's about and what yeah. it's for. Yeah, Oak is, is kind of a, this crazy mixture of me being into like all the body hacking stuff, but mm -hmm. also into meditation. So what we did that's really kind of crazy different, one, we wanted to just like, teach meditation and not have it be prescriptive. There's a lot of great meditation apps out there yeah, that's that are prescriptive. Yeah, kind of what I was gonna say is there's a lot of these already. Oh no, there's, they're, they're yeah. great. I mean, if you wanna go and you have a fear of flying or anxiety or depression, or there's a bunch of them that are um, Headspace and Calm. These are great apps that, that I've used for a long time. Um, Oak is not that. We, we are very um, traditional meditation techniques and our goal is to train people and then get them not to do guided meditations. We want to set them free and just have them do a standard meditation timer so they can meditate on their own. Like, in, you know, you don't, you don't really go and see monks sitting in the mountains using apps to meditate, right? They, they're they're trained up and then they... I rarely go to the mountains for my <laughs> right? meditation anymore. Yeah. yeah. So um, that was one of the things we want to do. But the second thing we want to do that I think is really interesting is rather than say, we know what's best for people and create a guided meditation, we wanted to use the, the wisdom of the crowds to create our, our guided meditation. So we had thousands of people sign up for the beta. And what they did is they were presented with these different surveys if they ended a meditation early or post meditation, and they would give us feedback on all the different points of the meditation. And so we did hundreds and hundreds of iterations to the meditation in terms of the sound and pacing of the meditation, the words that we were using to describe certain things in the meditation. And so we made all these edits and eventually came out, once we got above a certain threshold of, um, we had them rated between a one and 10 of how much they enjoyed the meditation. Once we got above an eight, which was you know hundreds of modifications oh, later, um, then we released the actual meditations out to the world. So we, yeah, it's basically um, a guided meditation app where you can come in and do um, up to 30 minute guided meditations um, with male or female instructor. And then once you're ready, you can go and meditate on your own with just a, a good timer. The next thing that we're doing, well, I should say two more things. One, we have breathing exercises that's, that are yeah, in there as well. I use those, those are interesting. Tell us about those. Yeah, so I mean, one of the things that's really powerful is these, um, these types of breathing exercises that the pranayama kind of yogic breathing mm -hmm. um, that we, we put in there so if you don't have time to do a meditation, you can just go in there and do a quick breathing exercise and we guide you through all of that and then track like your streak so we can see how many you've, consecutive you've done um, in a week or in a month. Um, and so that's one piece of it. But the, the real cool piece going forward and what we're working on now is tying in heart rate data and heart rate variability to your meditations and your breathing oh, exercises. Nice. So we wanna be the kind of the quantified self version of meditation so that when you come in um, in this next release, once we get it out there, you'll be able to use your Apple Watch or your Fitbit or others, and we'll show you how your heart rate variability is improving over time as you're using it to meditate. So um, you can imagine like hooking in like all of these different wearables out there and like seeing a little graph of your data over time, um, kind of like you would a Fitbit app or something like that sure. with sleep data. We want to do that with meditation. And yeah, it's just something that we're decided to build and give away for free. So it's, uh, there's no paid upgrades or anything like that. It's Great. just like a, an app for people to enjoy. So it's called Oak. It'll be linked up in the show notes. You also have a podcast, which, uh, you should talk about. Yeah, it's, it's called The Kevin Rose Show. And essentially, I interview um, pretty much anyone that is a top performer. Um, I had like someone on there talking about Bitcoin last week. I had Tim Ferriss on the time before that. Um, I, and I try and really get at uh, all these different types of body hacks or life hacks and how to improve your life. So really trying to find little tidbits and information that people can use in their own daily life. It's a relatively new podcast. We have uh, 16 episodes out right now. Um, but yeah, it's been a, a fun thing to have on some of these top performers and tease out uh, what they're really passionate about, what they're good at. The Kevin Rose Show, easy to remember because it's your name. And that'll be linked up in the show notes as well. Perfect. All right, so there we go. Awesome, Perfect. thanks guys. Perfect.